Ah, yes, Hellboy. Certainly the most popular superhero in gaming as of the month of October 2023. Everyone's favorite Lovecraftian Antichrist turned easygoing paranormal investigator hasn't had many forays into the world of gaming, but there's certainly been enough that he's left his mark. Today we're going to take you through all of Hellboy's appearances in games and show you the good, the bad, and ugly of Mike Mignola's signature creation translated through the lens of interactive gameplay. Strike up your matches to preserve the flavor, work the kinks out of your stone-sculpted, carpal tunnel-ridden, god-given illegal boxing glove, and get ready to hear a lot of, ah, uh, crap. Hellboy, you got eyes on any of those cursed artifacts? Oh yeah, I have eyes on one of these stiffs. Yeah, you know, I'm feeling a bit stiff right now. Aha, it appears you're afflicted with Tankus Controllicus, the ancient curse of stifled movement found in many evil residences. Sidestep this one, eh, Red? A Hellboy Resident Evil clone is a pitch that sounds awesome on paper. The comics are chock full of creepy settings like ancient castles, cemeteries, and villages. I can easily see a game that has you exploring these kinds of environments, solving puzzles, gathering ancient artifacts for key items, and reading diaries that flesh out the folklore of whatever evil you're trying to dispel. Hellboy Asylum Seeker, originally Dogs of the Night on PC three years earlier, takes a shot at this concept. Is it as cool as it sounds, or is it another clumsy mess that pales in comparison to the king of the genre? <coughs> Asylum Seeker opens with an old man giving BPRD agents some exposition about the evil we'll be trying to rid the residents of. He explains that there is an ancient evil, known as the Nohox Canis, also known as Dogs of the Night, waiting for someone to open a portal on the night of an eclipse so they can invade Earth. Twin brothers who have somehow cheated death oppose each other, one protecting Earth from the Dogs of the Night and the other allying himself with them. We then cut to a cemetery where one of the agents is investigating the area and gets ambushed by a creature from the shadows. Now, I had to watch that cutscene like three times to figure out what the hell the old man was saying, cause the audio mixing is terrible. There are parts where the music completely drowns the dialogue and I had to just sort of place together what the old man was saying using context clues. Before the game starts, we get this little intro card with Mike Mignola art, which is awesome. The game is broken up into episodes, and each episode has one of these intro cards. Mignola has one of the most recognizable art styles in the industry, and it was a good call finding a place for it in this game. Hellboy and Sarah show up at the cemetery 72 hours after the agent's disappearance. His name's Peter, by the way. And they're here to find out what went down. I think Hellboy looks pretty good here. I'm a sucker for low poly PS1 graphics, they're easily my favorite retro video game aesthetic, and I love that indie games have kept this graphic style alive after all these years, so I'm being a little biased here. However, I, I do wish he had a few more layers of clothing here. No shaming, but seeing Hellboy walk around in what I imagine to be a pretty chilly cemetery in just short shorts looks super silly. He's like that one friend that insists on wearing basketball shorts in the dead of winter and is all like, you guys are cold? I don't get cold. So, the Resident Evil essential game mechanics are here. You got tank controls, fixed camera angles, and a loading screen every time you go through a door. Except they're all executed just... badly. I'm no stranger to tank controls, I'm well initiated with them, and I actually quite enjoy them. But controlling HB can be frustrating at times because pushing forward on the analog stick will make him take this big step forward, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but whenever I was trying to position myself in front of an interactable element in the environment, I found myself wrestling with the controls as I tried to position Hellboy at just the right spot. You can lightly push the analog stick forward to make him walk instead, 
but that just doesn't feel intuitive. I wish, and get ready for the first of many Resident Evil comparisons, you could just toggle between running and walking with the push of a button. By the time this game came out, developers started implementing actual 3D modeled environments into games with fixed camera angles, which does allow for the camera to pan around, follow the player, and overall be more dynamic. But I think it was a missed opportunity to not go with the pre-rendered backgrounds approach. For one, these backgrounds age like fine wine. Look at these backgrounds from Resident Evil. I know, I know, sorry. I also think this would have been a more conceivable way of implementing Mignola's signature art style of using heavy shadows and distinct color palettes that really make Hellboy pop from the background. After all, pre-rendered backgrounds are essentially paintings broken up into different layers to give the illusion of 3D space. Mignola could have done some himself, or at least be a consultant. By the way, that's not to say the environments here suck, they, they don't. They carry that appropriate moody atmosphere that should be present in all things Hellboy. Hellboy comics just have such a distinct look that I feel are essential for any medium we may find them in. This game having 3D modeled environments also allows for the camera to change perspectives and into a traditional third person camera angle whenever we enter a combat scenario. And boy, let me tell you, the combat in this game is easily the worst aspect. This is the big caveat when making a Resident Evil style Hellboy game. Hellboy is a big action hero sort of guy. I mean, just look at his design. He was practically born to fight big monsters. So going the action beat em up style game is the obvious route. But I appreciate the guys at Cryo Studios going in the direction that they did for this game. It's really inspired in hindsight, even with all its faults. But you do lose out on getting any satisfying combat. The combat here is kind of non-existent really. Like yeah, you can punch enemies with your right hand of doom, but there aren't any mechanics here for me to play around with. Combat boils down to you positioning yourself in front of the monster and holding down the square button. No joke. This strategy can be applied to just about any enemy you encounter. And oh my god, enemies take so long to die. It took me two minutes to take down just two zombies. What a slog. You do get to use the Good Samaritan, which I think I shot a total of three times. I ended up stocking up ammo in case I came across tough enemies for no reason. Because just punching enemies and stun locking them pretty much guarantees your survival. And that's the thing, there's no survival element in this game. When fixed camera angles and tank control bearing video games have some sort of combat element, it's not really about how good combat mechanics feel. It's more about making the decision of do I spend my resources on this enemy to clear a path or can I circumvent them and save my resources for a bigger threat? You know, like Resi- That philosophy is not found in Asylum Seeker at all. Combat encounters go one of two ways. Guarantee your victory by standing in place in front of an enemy and mindlessly holding down the square button, or easily run by them without giving it a second thought. Look at how I easily avoid these three-legged penis monsters. I actually think it would have been pretty bold of this game to completely ditch any combat mechanics and instead treat each enemy encounter like a puzzle. You know, like a point and click adventure game, where it's about using the right item or interacting with something in the environment to take the enemy down. There's actually one instance in this game where that's the case. There's this big bug monster that's infesting the place with smaller bugs. Attacking her directly doesn't do anything. But you'll notice that whenever you clear a room of her gross little bug spawns, she'll birth more of them. When she's squeezing these little guys out of her bunghole, she'll lift her head exposing a hidden nook in the room. You gotta use this brief window to slip underneath her and get to this spot to activate an explosive that'll take her out. Now, this didn't exactly blow my socks off, but I did think it was a step in the right direction. And if these instances got more and more complex as the game went on, I think it would have been far more engaging than the brain dead combat we have here. Let's catch up with the story. After investigating the cemetery for a bit and solving some simple puzzles, we find Peter dead. We fight a topless owl lady and get separated from Sarah. I ran around in circles in this area for way longer than I should have because it's so dark I couldn't tell that there was a torch in this wall for me to use my lighter on. After fighting these ghouls with fucking T-1000 hook arms, we come across the first major puzzle. We gotta balance out these pedestals using rocks of different shapes and sizes. Seems easy enough. Uh, okay, you go there, that one here, and this one here. Hmm. 
didn't work. Okay, how about you here, that one there, and this one here? No? Okay, I got this, I got this. Okay, that one here, this one there, and you here. Arrgh. That one there, this one there, and this one here. Fuck! One eternity later. Okay, this one there, that stone here, and that one there. Ha! First try. The puzzles in this game were unexpectedly amusing and were never obscure or frustrating. I was able to solve all of them without the help of a guide, which I consider to be a big plus. Some of them were hilarious with how ludicrous the solution to them was. Like this one part where a creepy skelly guy won't let you into a room because you're not a monk. So Hellboy just fucking pockets a decapitated monk's head and holds it in front of his face when he confronts the guy again. And it works! I was expecting the puzzles in this game to take themselves more seriously. Revolving around folklore riddles and the like that you have to decipher or play some keys on a piano that correspond to a poem. But no, sometimes you just gotta feed a hungry kid some chicken. After reaching the asylum we sought after, we yeet a crazy one-armed nurse out a window, get barfed on, and discover one of the wizard twin brothers living in the walls. He explains that every 666 years, an eclipse happens that brings our realm the closest it possibly can to hell. The last time his evil twin brother attempted to open a portal to hell during the eclipse, he stopped him with the help of an amulet. With that amulet nowhere to be found in the present, the wizard sends us on an excellent adventure 666 years in the past. One thing that really hinders this game's pacing is this boring ass loading screen. It pops up every time you go through a door, and in a game where you're constantly backtracking and sometimes getting turned around and lost for a bit, these loading screen times really add up and I found myself glancing at my phone and getting distracted. In a game like Silent Hill, loading into a new room doesn't take more than 2 or 3 seconds, so it's not really an issue. Resident Evil takes a bit longer, but it plays this short cutscene where we shift into the player character's POV as they creep up to the door and swing it open. It's a really effective technique that builds tension and makes this transition into a new room feel seamless. This bland ass loading screen in Hellboy feels like you're hitting a 4 foot high speed bump and is really outdated when other games of this style were being craftier about this sort of thing. So after solving a few more puzzles and fighting this nightmare feel of a boss, we recover the amulet and go back to the future. Oh. I friggin love this bit of Hellboy falling flat on his face like it's a family guy gag. This following sewer section puts Evil Dead Hell to the King's hedge maze to shame. Every corridor looks exactly the same. I never felt the need for a map in this game, except for this section. I absolutely had to look one up on GameFAQs. It's damn near impossible to navigate these sewers since there are hardly any landmarks or any type of indicator letting you know where you are. Eventually we make it to hell where Sarah is being held captive and fight one of the most disappointing final bosses I've ever experienced. Because you don't really fight it. All you do is run into four of the same zombies we've encountered before, just colored red this time and punch them to death to raise these platforms and reach Sarah. With the day saved, we eat shit one last time and brush off the fact that we'll have to deal with the same problem in another 666 years. Thankfully, I won't be around for that. Hellboy Asylum Seeker is unfortunately a bad video game debut for the Dark Horse icon. Apart from a few amusing puzzles, there's really not a whole lot to enjoy here. The story leaves a lot to be desired, which was the most heartbreaking aspect with how many great stories there are to pull from the comics or be inspired by. I do have to highlight Hellboy's voice actor, David Gassman. This is the first time Hellboy was given a voice, four years before Perlman became the one everyone thinks of and Gassman absolutely knocks it out of the park. He sounds a lot more like the voice I hear in my head when reading Hellboy comics. I don't like this. Perlman brings a lot more charisma and humor to the character, whereas Gassman nails the man of few words and schlubby vibe of Big Red in the comics. So this is definitely the highlight of the game. Perhaps going in a more combat focused direction for a Hellboy game will fare better. Given, you know, Big rock hand.
right, that takes care of the first artifact. Abe, any idea what the next one is? Abe. One moment, I'm making progress. Find yourself someone else that's talking about the Hellboy Java game in 2023. We're doing great things here. Simply titled Hellboy, here we have a fairly competent 2D platformer that kind of reminds me of the old Prince of Persia games. It features an original story of Hellboy getting stuck in some sort of spiritual world ruled by a Native American shaman. Along the way you'll fight Nazis, frog monsters, werewolves, and even a handful of bosses. And I've got to be honest, I was kind of surprised by the number of combat options given here. As you'd expect, you can punch enemies with your right hand of doom, or just shoot them with the Good Samaritan. But you can also use the actual environment to your advantage by picking up crates to toss at enemies, pushing rocks down a slope to stop oncoming bad guys, and shooting stalactites to bring them down upon unsuspecting foes. Take enough hits and Hellboy's right hand of doom will ignite, allowing you to do extra damage. There are also these shooting gallery sections that do a pretty good job of adding a bit of variety to what would otherwise be a very bare bones game. Now, I can't say I loved my time with the Hellboy Java game, but, you know, it did its thing. I beat Hellboy's own high score in the survival mode. Oh, come on, man, five seconds. And you're supposed to be the guy to bring forth Armageddon? Pfft. Hellboy 2 The Golden Army also got a mobile game called Tooth Fairy Terror, and it's based on this one moment right here. You tap away using the Good Samaritan as you blast through swarms of tooth fairies to build up a high score. Shaking your iPhone reloads your gun, and that's just about all the game has going for it. Really not the most exciting use of the Hellboy property, if we're being honest. Gentlemen, this one's worse than we thought. You'll have to hurry. And here I was thinking I could take my sweet time. Maybe go for a nap. Lobster, how are you doing on your end? I've spotted the lout. I'll show him what for. You know, Lobster, I appreciate you coming on this assignment with me and all. Big fan. But, uh, how do you plan on destroying the artifact? I mean, I have this thing. Big old right hand of doom. Supposed to be the key to Armageddon or something. Folks tell me I'm Anumun Rama, but yeah, it's just too much for me, man. I tried. Shot the thing, didn't you? I just shot the thing. Brevity is appreciated. Seeing as how the execution of a Resident Evil clone was lacking, I think it made more sense for them to get a standard beat-em-up route for the next Hellboy game since those were all the rage back then and he's a unique character that loves to clobber things. Unfortunately though, Hellboy the Science of Evil is a big load of Hellboy's favorite word. Oh, crap. You know, in my memory, PS3 games look just as photorealistic as games today. Then I play them again and see they barely look a step above PS2 games. Well, not all the expensive ones. But for a game like this, these graphics have that dark and muddy texture that's so emblematic of the time period. Games were just more grimy back then. I do like the flashback level set in Japan, though. It's a nice break from the rest of the game's cave-like atmosphere. Oh, dear God, that jump. Please don't make me platform like this. It's like the game starts to stutter when I jump because it can't handle the camera suddenly jerking up into the air that quickly and then coming back down just as fast. The longer you hold down the jump button, the more you'll kind of float? I guess it's not the worst I've ever seen, but it feels pretty clumsy. I like how we've settled on a good middle ground between Mike Mignola's geometric and stylized depiction of Hellboy and the realistic version. He's got that cartoonishly square chin, but still doesn't look completely out of place in real life aside from being a literal devil. Injustice 2's Hellboy model may have taken some notes from this one a few years later. Although here's a dumb nitpick, I think his right hand of doom is too big. God, ah! Much like the David Harbour version, it's just so out of proportion with his normal hand that it doesn't feel like another appendage, but instead a big glove he's holding. The right hand of Doom is definitely bigger and badder, but he doesn't have to be a lopsided left for dead boomer freak. Scale it back so he looks like it's actually part of his body, you know? This game doesn't really have any puzzles to speak of. The best you have are special alternate ammo types that unlock things for you, so you just shoot them to progress. Sometimes you need to go hunt for a candlestick or a torch to burn these red vines because Twizzlers are better. Then you just get a special ammo type that can do it for you. And, uh, yeah, that's it. You just shoot stuff. 
It's a bit lazy and doesn't really work well enough to offer a reprieve from the combat. This ain't no Pandora's Temple, that's for sure. Like any hack and slash beat em up, spectacle fighter, brawler, god of war, devil may cry clone, you get a light attack and a strong attack and all the fun little button mashy combos therein. However, unlike god of war, this game's combat didn't have an instant pick up and play factor for me. It took a little bit of time to get used to because Hellboy stands out in this genre full of agile blade wielding characters by being slow and deliberate in his moveset which I think fits the character well. He's not a ninja, he's a bulking brawler that smashes with his big club fist. Because of his natural endowment, he favors his right hand a lot in combat, making him a little asymmetrical with the type of punches he throws. HB doesn't really have the range of a Blades of Chaos chainsword thingy. He has to be right up on enemies to do the most damage, so the game forces you to push yourself in close for grappling enemies and combos. There's a big emphasis on grabbing foreign objects in fights too, like tombstones, barrels, fence posts, trees, ladders, boxes, and other stuff he can hold like a sword in that way that he always does. Hellboy just isn't Hellboy unless he's resting a giant sword on his shoulder and then breaking it two seconds later because he's a clumsy and brutish combatant. On paper this all sounds well and good, but I just don't love the execution of the combat. Being so heavy and solid should make you feel like you pack more of a punch, but instead it just feels like playing as a moderately strong guy with weights in his shoes. I don't get the satisfying crunch of destruction under my stone fist that I so desperately desire. The enemies just feel like slippery little bars of soap that I'm just chasing around desperately trying to catch. They're so fast and small and Hellboy's a walking brick. He's also brick colored. The combat also feels... unfinished? It's just the same two mechanics of bashing things and then shooting them with your slow ass gun. But there's no way to combine the two in any kind of combo system. Shooting completely breaks the flow of your hand to hand combat, and punching prevents you from being able to aim with any certainty. It's one or the other, but I'd like to be able to mix and match the approach. There's also no defensive options at all because Hellboy can't block or evade, so you're just SOL if anyone tries to hit you or one of the bosses does a grab attack. Oh shit, it's fucking Cygor! Uh, for those of you who don't know what the word Cygor stands for, it's short for Cybernetic Gorilla. It's so bizarre to not have a block or parry or anything because the R1 button is right there and it has no function at all. It's completely unassigned for the whole game. Weird. There's also no upgrades or skill trees or any of that. Honestly, it's kind of refreshing because I personally hate overly complex skill trees, but it hurts this game because there's no sense of progression. I don't feel any stronger in the last level than I do in the first. I'm still just using the same basic attacks and combos. Nothing has changed in any way. For this genre of game, this is really weird. All of these types of games have upgrades, even goddamn Spider-Man friend or foe has unlockable moves and a point system. I really feel like this game isn't finished. The slowness of movement also makes it harder to deal with enemies that have any ranged attacks, like the machine gun Knotsmans and the gas masks. They can get off so many shots in the time it takes for you to slowly waddle over to them. When fighting most enemies in the later half of the game, they drunkenly slump to the ground and ragdoll out after a few punches, then get back up to keep tormenting you. So the more efficient move is to hit them with a weapon to stun them, then do a finisher move. Combat also just feels way more satisfying with a weapon in hand because you have better reach and you can hurt crowds of enemies more easily. So put these two together and it just makes using your fists seem kind of pointless? Almost like you should go out of your way to not do it because it's so harmless? Then they throw enemies at you that can't be grabbed or killed with a finisher in the desert level, and I just start to lose patience with it, either by shooting enemies repeatedly which seems to have basically no effect on them, or bullying this one individual that kept getting back up for hours. Hey Bat Dad, I didn't hear no Bat- <laughs> Enemies being this spongy in a game like this isn't fun, it's just tedious. I'm punching the same guy for like a full 60 seconds each every encounter, and it just brings the pacing to a dead halt. Turns out the enemies in the desert level can only be beat with these orange crystals in the environment or these swords, or turning the crystals into an ammo type. Again, no fists. Hand-to-hand -hand melee combat is useless in this hand-to-hand -hand melee combat game. Fuck. This game's also got a real problem with stuff randomly not working. 
Sometimes you'll pull the trigger and your gun won't fire. Sometimes you hit the button to grab an enemy and it just doesn't work. Sometimes you try to switch ammo types and it just doesn't do it. I also had problems with enemies clipping out of bounds where I couldn't fight them, forcing me to restart the encounter. Enemies can also get stuck on the environment and I have to backtrack to go find them so I can get through the door and that's embarrassing for everyone involved. It's not the most consistent or stable game, but it works just well enough that I was still able to beat it. Barely. There's a really shitty part in the fourth level where you need to drop enemies into a pit to progress, but you can't throw them into it. They need to just tumble in as a ragdoll after being knocked down. Here, look, I actually tested it. Throwing it does not count. Knocking them in like this does. I have no idea why this is like this. There's not much that can be said for bosses. This game has barely any. The first is a fight with Saigor that really took me back to the olden days of gaming when you were supposed to just figure shit out by yourself. Turns out this boss is invincible and the only way to beat him is to tear down the support beams on every floor of the building to collapse the ceiling on him. If this game was made today, there'd be several intrusive hints on the screen flat out telling me what to do or multiple friendly NPCs standing off to the side shouting the solution at me in the form of a question so I could still feel like it was my idea. It's nice to not have your hand held, but there was zero indication that this was the intended strategy and it took me forever to figure it out. So game design sucked then and it sucks now for completely opposite reasons. It's crazy, there's never been a single good video game in history. Except for Pac-Man World on PS1. Next boss is the witch lady and you just throw things at her and that's it. Sucks. Big worm thing, you throw rocks at it, then shoot a laser at it. It's annoying because it's hard to throw stuff at the worm when your auto target keeps wanting to hit the soldiers on the ground instead. Sucks. I just fucking fuck this final boss. Obviously, Ron Perlman plays Red in the game, but this also has a two-player co-op mode to make things less of a tedious drag. And player two can be Liz Sherman or Abe Sapien, with their actors from the film reprising their roles. Between this and the animated movies, these three were just really dedicated to these characters at the time, and I admire that. The co-op mode is the same as most games. Any bad game is a little bit more fun with a friend. The tedium is reduced when you can punch every enemy at twice the speed. Though player 2 is a bit less useful since they can't grab heavier objects and enemies or break down doors, so they're at player 1's mercy. Liz doesn't even get a gun, so she can't help with any of the gun-based puzzles. Selma Blair and Doug Jones provide incredibly small roles with just like, tiny bits of generic dialogue that are hard to hear over the combat, and are just like, commenting on random things in the gameplay. I played for like 30 minutes and heard Abe say one line. Liz Sherman can't even technically be in these flashback levels because she'd be like a year old or not born yet. This is the definition of tacked on. There was no thought that went into the co-op mode. You might be wondering why I haven't talked about it yet, but this game doesn't exactly have a strong story, or really any kind of story. It's full of cutscenes of NPC skeletons with the same voice just making vague allusions to some kind of like, dark backstory, but never actually saying anything definite or interesting. I almost don't know why they bothered getting Ron Perlman for this if all he's going to do is throw out deadpan quips and dry humor. He doesn't interact with the BPRD or any of the other major Hellboy characters. There's nothing for him to really bounce off of or interact with. He's just kind of talking to himself the whole game. You just go from place to place cracking wise at monsters, but nothing's really happening. There's no plot. I guess at best you find out that all of this was being orchestrated by this metalhead guy to create a big monster with dark magic but like the story doesn't really matter until like the last like five minutes and then you just kill the thing that he made easy paycheck for mr perlman i guess even still it's nice to have him here because he fits the character so well his speech in the desert is just a delight i love this scene now someone, not an idiot, but someone might see this as just a new cautionary metaphor merging with the old one. The encroaching industrial world and all that. Oh yeah, that's another thing. You remember the X-Men Origins Wolverine game that would shift perspective between two time periods ten years apart to give variety between the levels and demonstrate the connection between Wolverine's past and his present? This is nothing like that. For some reason, this just has random flashback levels to different time periods twice and then never again. 
One 20 years ago, another 40 years ago. They don't really have any reason to be there, and they barely tie into the main game's plot at all. I think they just wanted the game to not exclusively be in a stuffy European village. How come these Nazis are using the new Twitter logo on their uni- Oh. Final boss is garbage, then the game just abruptly stops because they didn't finish it. That's it. That That's the ending. Did you know you can't get 100% completion in this game's achievements because the last two chapters were going to be released as DLC and they cancelled it after the game's critical and financial failure? Bruce Campbell was gonna be Lobster Johnson in the DLC! His name's still in the credits! Fuck! What a kick in the nuts! That would have been awesome despite the game's failings. I really wish I liked this one more because I thought it looked awesome when I was a kid and I just never got a chance to play it until like this month and then, uh, you know, how do you fuck up a God of War clone with Hellboy? That should have been so easy, but they did. I wish it was better. I wish the combat felt more crunchy. I wish it had a better art style. <sighs> Thanks for nothing. Hellboy The Science of Evil also got a PSP version that somehow manages to be better than the main console version. It's essentially the same experience, but an overall abridged version of its big brother counterpart, and it does the game favors. Levels are shorter, which gives the game a brisk pace. Combat is simpler, with combos being more limited and the ammunition type system being completely absent. This more streamlined approach puts the game in this safe area, that makes the game unremarkable, but also not a pain in the ass to get through. Unfortunately, there isn't any voice acting to be found, which sucks because Perlman's performance is probably one of the few highlights of the other version, and cutscenes are replaced by these 2D animatics. That's always a good way for these comic book licensed games to capture some of the source material's style. I think the graphics age far better here. They're not as detailed as the main console versions, but the bright colors and smooth textures avoid that muddy, ugly look that so many games of this generation suffer from. This version also supports co-op play. Whereas the 360 and PS3 version lets you play the entire story mode in co-op, the PSP version has separate levels and changes the camera angle that's akin to something like X-Men Legends. If you're looking to play Hellboy The Science of Evil, I'd say go with the PSP version. You can beat it in a few hours, and again, it's, it's a better experience than the main console version. Fighters approaching the Batcave. Now we all know I've never been too keen on Injustice's story, but if there's anything to gush about, it's their non-canon guest characters. Sometimes taking a page from Mortal Kombat's book and pulling in punchy, fighty badasses from other franchises. Thus we have Ninja Turtles, some Mortal Kombat guys, and everyone's favorite club-fisted Hellspawn, as opposed to the club-footed Hellspawn. Hellboy has a great look in this game. He's still blocky and stylized, but doesn't look out of place in this realistic setting. First thing that stands out is how weird it is that they can't really do asymmetrical character designs, so his fist switches sides with him to keep from animating the moves differently depending on what half of the screen you're on. His moveset is appropriately uncomplicated. It's just all different variants of smacking you with the right hand of doom or shooting with the Samaritan pistol. He's not exactly known for having a huge variety of moves or a big arsenal of weapons and gadgets. He doesn't need all that most of the time, but here it would've been nice to throw in a little something else. It's fun to see him chatting it up with characters you'd never normally see him interact with, like DC heroes, Mortal Kombat fighters, or the damn Ninja Turtles, the other kings of indie comics. Bet that shell comes in handy. Against the right hand of doom? You bet. Don't worry, I won't crack it. Begin. If I had any complaints, it's that John Constantine isn't in this game so they can't bond over their shared love of smoking, trench coats, paranormal investigation, and not giving a damn. Brawlhalla is a free-to-play Super Smash Bros. clone that I absolutely suck at. It features a ton of guest characters from Street Fighter, Ben 10, Avatar The Last Airbender, and a bunch more. Hellboy was included to coincide with the unfortunate release of the 2019 reboot, as well as other characters from the movie like Nimue, Gruagak, and Daimyo. Hellboy is a skin for Brawlhalla's own character, Cross. It works perfectly since Cross has these giant gauntlets that can be easily reskinned as Hellboy's right hand of doom. 
I always have a hard time playing these kinds of party fighting games because I can't keep track of where I am in the midst of chaos between four fighters. So I'll just check out the PvE horde mode that also happened to be included in the Hellboy update. Yeah! Look, look at me go. These hallways are like a maze. Yeah, no kidding. I'm getting turned around here. I think I hear something. Something big. Oh crap. So do I. Oh. Sorry about that, lobster. Don't sweat it, Red. I think we're getting close to the source of the curse. It's gonna take everything we got to snuff it out. Oh, don't worry. I came prepared. You're the only guy I know who I'm certain is not compensating with that thing. Thanks. If anything, that sword is on the small side for him. There's that son of a bitch. All right, you foul, wretched spawn of hell. Hey. Uh, sorry. Prepare to feel the wrath of the claw. All right, this one has the best art style of all of them, no contest. It just looks like Mignola art in motion. I haven't seen this since the amazing screw on head. Between this and Hi-Fi Rush, I think cell shaded brawlers are making a comeback. I truly miss games using a stylized graphical look to replicate comic styles like Telltale's Walking Dead or Ultimate Spider-Man basing their models on Mark Bagley art. This game perfectly captures the specificity of the Hellboy art style. The rounded shapes that have little imperfect angular corners on them. The stylized anatomy and geometric proportions of Mignola's pencils. I can't get over it. Even the simple single colored backgrounds that clash with the shadows and dark colors the characters create a really unique contrast just like the panels. It's all here. I remember seeing a Hellboy fan animation on Twitter some odd years ago. It perfectly translated Mignola's art style into 3D and I thought like I'm certain many others did, man, this would be perfect for an animated movie or a video game. Then shortly after that, Upstream Arcade released West of Dead, a roguelike isometric shooter with an art style very much inspired by Mike Mignola. Not only that, but Ron Perlman also voices the player character. It seemed like the stars were aligning for an inevitable Hellboy game in this art style, and they indeed were. Upstream Arcade is back once again with a roguelike, Hellboy. Web of Word. This game tells an original story that's very much in line with what we come to expect from Hellboy comics. The BPRD has picked up some psychic spikes scattered around the earth that when decoded, reveal coordinates pointing to an old abandoned house in Argentina. In the house we discover a chamber that drops us to a separate dimension known as the Word. It houses creepy living statues, were-rabbits, and godlike entities that speak in riddles. It's all appropriately Hellboy with its overall tone and the way the story is delivered. Something in the word is causing spikes in the normal world, and it's up to Hellboy to dive in over and over again until we find out what. Shaharazad, Shaharazad, Sh Charizard. I'm definitely not one of those guys that insists one actor who is good in a role was born to play the character and can never be recast. Ron Perlman nailed it with Hellboy, obviously, but I'm open to other actors voicing him and playing him in the movies, so Lance Reddick getting cast for this role immediately made me more excited for this game because he was always one of my favorite actors. He's the guy who got one over on Eric Andre on his own show. Need a new desk. He's earned the respect of John Wick, and by God, he was a fucking fantastic Albert Wesker, despite the show he was in being wall-to-wall doo-doo save for his performance. His take on Hellboy stands out to me because he's not just doing an impression of Perlman's version like most guys do. The personality shines through as the same calm and composed wisecracking devil we know and love, but he just reads the lines in his own way and makes it his own. It's one of the biggest highlights of this game for me. As long as there are no balloon animals, lady, we're good. Rest in power, Lance. You are a goddamn legend. Much like Upstream Arcade's last game, Web of Word is a roguelike, so you can expect the usual elements found in the genre like procedurally generated levels, randomized items, and permadeath. Huge asterisks on that permadeath though, because I found this to be one of the most casual roguelikes I've ever played. The game is really generous with its checkpoint system given its genre, 
to the point where at times it feels like it's structured almost like a traditional linear action game for the majority of its runtime. The deeper you get into the story, the more the game starts to feel like an actual roguelike, eventually asking you to do a straight run from the first level all the way to the final boss without dying. I like that the game contextualizes why Hellboy needs to clear multiple levels in one go. There's a part where the BPRD agents take bets on how many tries it will take Hellboy to do a complete run. I thought that was clever. Hellboy stories often deal with pocket dimensions and other fantastical realms, so making sense of the concept of runs in roguelike games within the context of a Hellboy story can be easily done. I don't really play roguelikes. In fact, I, uh, I didn't really even know what a roguelike was. I actually had to ask Diego about it. But for some reason, any time I've ever heard the term roguelike, it sent me into a blind rage where I wanted to kill someone. And I don't know why. Like, I hear someone go like, man, I'd, I'd like a roguelike in this in this f franchise. Like a Star Wars roguelike. And then, then I hear that, and then I just want to just start swinging, you know? I just want to bite someone's jugular and just start drinking their blood. Does that make sense? Hey X. Yeah, it's, it's Diego. I'm, yeah, I'm almost done editing the reviews. Um, you alright, man? We have a ragtag group of BPRD agents to hang out with in the hub world known as the Butterfly House, in between trips to the word. There's team leader Tatler. She's a no-nonsense hard-ass who's a little shaky when it comes to trusting Hellboy. She's a woman of faith, so Hellboy's demon-looking ass makes her nervous to say the least. There's the obligatory team Psychic Lucky, voiced by none other than Wolverine himself. Turned out there was a fundamental design flaw. Poor guy never stood a chance. Foulmouth tech expert Altman. The conversations with this guy always trip me out a bit because the way he stands almost looks like he's T-posing, so I thought the game was glitching out on me. And finally, there's our two folklore experts, Mads and Benson, that you can talk to to get a better understanding of all the supernatural phenomena you come across. I've said it a ton of times before, but I love hub worlds in comic book games. It's the perfect opportunity to flesh out the world by having all sorts of conversations with the supporting cast, as well as offering a bit of a cozy breather in between the action. And Web of Word did not disappoint in that regard. This is mostly where the story will progress. Every time you return from a run in the Word, you'll have a new conversation unlocked that advances the plot. Besides catching up with the team, you can also read any diary entries you've collected, examine artifacts, and level up your gear, stats, and weapons. Leveling up Hellboy and your arsenal is another way this game is very casual in its roguelike elements. All of the upgrades you make to your weapons, gear, and Big Red himself are permanent. I don't have a whole lot of experience with this genre, but the roguelikes I have played are not as generous as this one. Dying will usually have your character start as a blank slate, and it's all about how lucky you are in any given run when it comes to coming across upgrades. So even if you aren't doing so hot in subsequent runs in Web of Word, your odds are only going to get better sooner rather than later because you'll be stocking up on the currency that goes towards upgrades. This game stands in a place that makes it seem like it was a little shy to fully embrace the roguelike genre. And I know there's a term roguelite, to describe games that aren't as hardcore of an experience, but I'd hesitate to even call it that. On one hand, this game being more on the casual side avoids alienating players that may just be Hellboy fans and are looking to check out the latest video game based on the character without having their teeth kicked in. On the other hand, my right hand of doom one, the game left me yearning for a significant challenge. Leading up to this game's release, I played West of Dead for a couple days, you know, to sort of get into the mood. I had a lot of fun with that game. I think it hits the sweet spot for me in regards to difficulty. I always felt challenged, but it was never frustrating. I never knew what to expect with each new run, which made the game really exciting. I hit a few snags with Hellboy early on, but that was just me getting used to picking up on enemy patterns. Once I picked up on the most effective techniques, I was clearing rooms in less than 10 seconds. I do wish the game offered a higher difficulty setting, even the modifiers you unlock in the end game didn't do much for me. That being said, hitting a groove of dodging, parrying, and slamming enemies into stone pillars makes you feel like a total badass. 
Combat in this game has a surprising amount of depth and finally feels satisfying. Combat feedback is tricky because it's a combination of animation, sound design, camera motion, controller vibrations sometimes, and visual cues to make it really feel like what you're doing is effectively damaging the opponent. Science of Evil makes it feel like you're fighting paper bags full of mashed potatoes underwater. Web of Word feels like you're a stone-fisted devil bashing monsters to death with your super strength. They nailed the responsiveness in this game's fighting mechanics. I like how punchy combat feels and how it manages to feel satisfying despite not having a whole lot of mechanics. No doubt because of how responsive the controls are and how heavy attacks are accentuated with comic booky visual effects. But the focus on 1v1 encounters sometimes feels like a detriment because the smaller cannon fodder enemies are pretty much pointless. They're not a threat and they explode once you beat up the main big dude in the room. You, you can go pretty much the whole game ignoring them. While the levels nail the aesthetics found in the comics with simple color palettes and moody atmosphere, and you do have different biomes to get through, each with their own theme and unique enemies, like an underwater town with crustacean monsters, a spooky forest with rotting beasts, and a ramshackle subway with a giant man bats. The change in scenery is great and all, but you'll quickly notice that these are all pretty much laid out identically, just with a different coat of paint. You walk down a hallway, enter a room, usually one with a clearing in the middle with a few pillars laid out, and an elevator portion that you can reach by walking up a ramp. There's not much else to do in between combat encounters besides looking for extra rooms that offer buffs and health pickups, Sometimes you'll encounter these purple booby traps that are of no consequence. You'd have to be an imbecile to fall for one of these. Most of the time they come in the form of these floating balls that don't even move so you can easily walk around them. Or these brief bursts of fire that you just have to wait a few seconds to pass. They're more of a minor inconvenience than anything else. I did like the bosses because for the most part it did feel like I was fighting a genuine tougher enemy. Their attack patterns are a bit trickier and they obviously have a bigger health bar and do more damage. Sometimes I feel like bosses in AAA games are more about putting the spectacle up front rather than having a formidable foe to go mano a mano with. Like I'm just picking up on simple patterns while I wait for the next prompt to trigger a big fancy cutscene. Taking down bosses and Hellboy felt satisfying. Even with all that being said, I feel like there's something missing in the presentation. I just feel like I want a Hellboy game with a bigger emphasis on story because those comics are so steeped in lore and paranormal investigation stuff, but these games come in and just want to focus on hitting monsters. Let me do some detective stuff, I don't know, anything to break up all the gameplay of just fighting. Science of Evil was just taking you to random locations with little to no connection, and this is at least more coherent than that. But so much of this story is told through exposition in these stiff conversations back at base and not really shown through the gameplay. Plus, the way these are structured gives you kind of this awkward, like, waiting for the guy to say his next line pause between dialogue. When I touch things, this little box whispers, secretos. Anything useful so far? Not yet, but it is a big house. I will say, though, this game looks really good for something on such a tight budget. You always know a game doesn't have much money when their cutscenes are doing like this like motion comic thing instead of like full motion video, but somehow I just kind of get over it here because it looks like a Hellboy comic so much that I just completely forget. While it may not be the deepest game in most aspects, Web of Word is a low budget title going for as low as 20 bucks depending when and where you get it, which was kind of refreshing in the midst of massive games that seem to come out every other week. I may not recommend it for people that are looking for a challenging roguelike, but I would recommend it for Hellboy fans that want a game that authentically captures the aesthetic and vibes of the books. As well as to hear an absolutely badass take on Hellboy from Lance Reddick. That was weird. Word. It's impolite to correct people, son. No, I was agreeing with you. Oh, okay. Well done, gentlemen. This is a cause for celebration. Rotten eggs, anyone? I'm thinking seafood. Hey, check it out. Red lobster. 